So um, there's a there's a lot of stories like this in the in the Gemara, but um, the one that comes to mind is that uh, Rav Yochanan was uh, learning with Rav Kahana for the first time, and when he lifted up his eyes, he saw that Rav Kahana was smirking. So he wasn't he really smirking, smirking, but he had some birth defect, and right. Yochan was displeased, and Rukhana died on the spot. So, right. um, but my question really is in a general question about these kind of stories, which is why don't, why doesn't the you know rabbi who's doing the gazing or the killing kind of, why doesn't he just don the havskus? Like, why couldn't he just think that oh, like Rukhana might have some sort of birth defect? He's not really smirking at me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, it, it happens to be particularly about Rav Yochanan. Rav Yochanan had this, like, uh, seems like a gaze that could just put you to death, you know, and the like, like, uh, you know, x-ray vision or heat vision, like Superman used to have heat vision, and, and the like. So you have to understand what's going on. Certainly, I think the posture says Rav Yochanan did not intend to murder people. Rav Yochanan wasn't staring at people with the intention at, of killing them. But what happens is, that when a great, great Talmud Chacham is hurt or offended, HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes revenge, so to speak. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will avenge the pain of a great person. So when the Gemara describes Rav Yochanan looked at the person and the person burnt up, that meant Rav Yochanan was hurt. Now it could be that maybe Rav Yochanan then did judge him with but if initially Rav Yochanan had even one second of Agma Snefesh, that could have a tremendous repercussion of very, very negative consequences. You know, we see this, I'll give you another example of it. In Bava Metziah, we have uh, the famous uh, Gemara where Rabbi Eliezer was put in cheirim because he refused to accept the decision of the majority. Do you remember, that's when he did a lot of miracles. Um, you know, the tree uprooted itself and the water reversed its course and the walls of the Beis HaMedrash were going to collapse, and a voice from heaven said, the halachas like Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi and the Chachamim still said, we don't listen. Loba we don't, we, don't, we don't even listen to God. And Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus was excommunicated, and uh, the Gemara, and uh, the Nasi of the Sanhedrin was Rabbi Gamliel, and the Gemara says Rabbi Gamliel was married to Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus' sister. So it's brought down in the Gemara, that she never let, Rabbi, she never, I'm sorry, the other way around, I'm sorry, Rabbi Eliezer was married to Rabbi Gamliel's sister. So it mentions that Rabbi Eliezer's wife never let him say Tachanun after Shemona Esrei, because Tachanun is a time that you express your anguish to God, and she was afraid that would hurt her brother. But uh, so she, she used to watch him and interrupt him so he wouldn't say Tachanun right away. So one day she thought it was Rosh Chodesh so she didn't have to watch him. There's no Rosh Tachanon, Rosh Chodesh. And it turned out it wasn't Rosh Chodesh. She saw him saying Tachanon, and she said to him, you killed my brother today. And the Gemara says she immediately got the news that Rabbi Gamliel, her brother, had died. Now again, the assumption is not that Rabbi Eliezer prayed that Rabbi Gamliel would die. That, that's not what we have to assume. But rather, when Rabbi Eliezer feels that anguish and feels that pain, Hashem, so to speak, avenges the kavod of the, of the gadol. So I think that's what's going on with Rabbi Yochanan as, as, as well. Um, of course, you'll recall the, the, first, the first part of the story that you didn't mention is also very, very interesting. Rav Shimon ben Lakish uh, was Rav Yochanan's brother-in-law. He had married Rav Yochanan's sister. And he had started off life as a highway robber, and he attacked Rav Yochanan once, and Rav Yochanan promised that if you learn Torah, you can marry my sister. And what happened was, every time Rav Yochanan said anything, Rosh Lakish would ask him 24 kachas. And Rosh Lakish died, that's also a tragic story, and they replaced him with Rav Kahana, who every time Rav Yochanan said something, Rav Kahana gave him 24 proofs that he was right. And uh, Rav Yechenin started crying. He says, where is Resh Lakish? I didn't need somebody to tell me I was right. I needed someone to question me because then I would either be choser or I would qualify or I would explain things better, understand things better. So that also tells you that uh, you don't need, uh, both in marriage and in learning, you, know, you don't necessarily need a yes man that says everything you say is right, but to question and discuss 
brings out the Torah. And that's why Rav Yochanan missed Resh Lakish and actually was not happy with Rav Kahana, even before the uh, thinking Rav Kahana was mocking him, mocking him and the like. But it just shows you how Chomer it is. In fact, I can tell you a story I just came across this week. It's a famous story, but I had forgotten the details about the tremendous cost in being Mavaza Talmud Chachem. This is a fascinating little story. I, I don't want to take up too much time with it. Uh, there was a town in the Ukraine, I'm not sure if it's still around, Slavita. And in the 1800s, uh, the printing press in Slavita was owned by some very Choshova Hasidish Yidin. And they wanted to print a beautiful shas. In fact, the Slavita shas is still considered to be one of the most beautiful shasin ever printed. It's went down the market recently, I think, an old copy of it for uh, $30,000, which is not huge, but for a shas, and that's a pretty good price for a shas. But they didn't want to invest all the money unless they got a haskama from the rabbanim that nobody could print another shas for 10 years. That was the custom in those days, an exclusivity period. So the Slavita shas was printed. They managed to dispose of the sell virtually everything they printed, but it was still within the 10 years. So they figured they would print a second edition and get more profit. The famous Vilna shas started printing their shas during the 10-year period. So the Slavita people brought a din Torah. They went to the great Rebbe Kiva Eger. And Rebbe Kiva Eger paskind that Vilna has the right to print the shas because the 10-year exclusivity period simply meant that until it was to give them time to sell their, their shas and recoup their investment. But if they recoup their investment within the 10 years, then you're back to competition. So Vilna was allowed to progress. So the Slavita Madfisim, they said, well, you know, they didn't think the Psak was right. And they said, you know, maybe Rebbe Kivega is getting a little old. And then they had some taina that maybe he was influenced by his son, Rav Shlomo Eger, who had a financial interest in the Vilna press. And Rebbe Kivager, who was the most humble and mild-mannered pe uh, people, uh, he was furious. He said this was a bizayin of Kavad Atayra. And he said he can't be mochel, the bizayin of Kavad Atayra. What happened after that is literally a nightmare. It's one of the worst nightmares you could possibly imagine. Somehow the next day, some guy, uh, Nanju, who was working in the Slavita press as a bookbinder, just committed suicide. He hung himself. Nobody knows particularly why. But a lot of the anti-Semites there wanted to blame the Jews that they thought this guy knew something about some crime they were committing, and they killed him. And what happened to the printers was that they were sentenced to life in Siberia. But only after they went through the gauntlet of 500 soldiers hitting them. As you, yeah, literally, you walk through and you're smashed. Uh, by a person, uh, and they would have to go through the gauntlet, um, 150 hits. That means three times through the 500 and the like. And if they survived, and that would be very, very unlikely, they would uh, go to Siberia. They did survive. In fact, it's even recorded that one of them lost his yarmulke in the middle, and he refused to move. He refused to move until they put the kippah on his head, and they just continued beating him and beating him and beating him and beating him, and he would not move. Anyway, uh, they wound up going to Siberia. They spent 15 years. They would have been there for life. What happened was the Tsar died, uh, Tsar Nicholas, and he was replaced by Tsar Alexander, his son, who was a little bit more humane, uh, and he, he uh, commuted their sentence. So they were whipped. They went through the, going through this gauntlet of 15 years in the horrendous conditions of Siberia. And they, they were tzaddikim. They said, we accept this as Hashem's punishment because we were pogeya in the kavod of Rabbi Akiva Eger. They accepted it, they accepted it. Horrendous, horrendous uh, story. I mean, it, it, even within Tsarist Russia, this was considered to be, even among secular historians, one of the greatest miscarriages of justice that ever occurred under the Tsar. And you gotta be pretty bad. I mean, every, <laughs> every decision the Tsars made were uh, in, in unjust and unfair, and this was considered to be the worst of the worst. I mean, this is a long story, but I'm just telling you to see the idea that when you're pogeya in the kavod of a godo, there will be very, very serious consequences. We have to be very careful about that. Okay. Uh, any, anything else? To, yeah. Um, 
there's uh, several genetic studies out now uh, regarding the Lebanese people that apparently over 90% of their DNA is traceable back to Canaanite genes. Hmm. I was wondering how does this interact with the uh, Gemara in Barajos uh, 28a where there's a man who is living in former Ammonite territory um, and it's a question of whether he can marry into, uh, into Judaism. Yeah, yeah, so just to uh, go over that Gemara for people who didn't, uh, don't uh, know what uh, you're referring to. Uh, the Torah says that a Moabite, a descendant of Moab, or a descendant of Ammon, these are from Lot's uh, daughters, are not allowed to marry into the Jewish people even if they convert. Now the halacha is that only applies to male Moabites and Ammonites. It does not apply to female. That's why Rus was permitted. So the Gemara in Brachos has a story. It's, it's a brisa where a, a so-called uh, Ammonite came before a basin and said, am I allowed to marry into the Jewish people if I convert? So the initial answer was, no, you cannot because you're a Mo an Ammonite. And the Torah says, Ammonites, Ammoni, are not allowed to marry into Klal Yisrael. But the Gemara's maskana is that when Sancheriv, the king of Assyria, exiled the ten tribes and really conquered the whole region, what he did was he transplanted populations, just like he took the ten tribes and sent them to other places. He took everybody who lived everywhere and they were tzimitched. So consequently, the people who lived in Edomite or Ammonite territory were no longer the original Ammonites. And the people who lived in Moabite territory were no longer the original Moabites. And therefore, your ethnic origin is unknown. And if your ethnic origin is unknown, me suffolk, you're going to be mutter. Because most of the world are not Moabites or Ammonites. If we don't know if you're an Ammonite or a Moabite, we follow the rove that you're not. And therefore, la halacha, even people who during the Second Temple period said, I'm an Ammoni, I'm a Moabi, Halachically, that didn't mean anything because Sancheirev transposed populations. By the way, the whole concept of exile was actually invented by Sancheirev. You know, the kings before him would either kill you or conquer you, but they, weren't, they, didn't, uh, they didn't have this idea of taking you and moving you to another place. No, that's not, self, that's not a self-evident aspect of war. The inventor very dubious honor, but the inventor of the concept of forcible exile was Sancheirev, the king of Assyria, because he thought that way you would be disoriented, you would be in an unfamiliar surrounding. If you're in an unfamiliar place, you're less able to organize rebellion. You don't know your way around, you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, the climate is different, the food is different, you're kind of disoriented. Sounds a little like Aliyah, but okay. So the idea was, and so halakhically that means the Ammonite is not the Ammonite, and the Moabite is not the Moabite, etc. So uh, your question is that uh, we do find that uh, the Lebanese, under a DNA test, seem to have the genotype of the Canaanites. That actually indicates that these were the indigenous people uh, that, 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 that were there. Uh, does that negate? Well, the truth of the matter is, I mean, I'll ask you a, a question on your question, and that is, you're asking from Sancheirev, I'll ask from much earlier, because the Canaanites should have been exterminated by Yehoshua bin Nun. So even before you get to Sancheirev, right? San, but uh, the Canaanites are the seven nations of Canaan, and the halacha was we were supposed to exterminate them. So Bichlau, how could there be Canaan? See, we were not commanded to exterminate Ammon and Moab. So there, we have to come on to Sancheirev was Mavalbel the Umos. But the Kananim, we were Mechuyev, Velo Sechayev Kol Neshama. But the short answer to that was that it's clear from the way the Rambam understands the whole Parsha that even for the seven nations of Canaan, if they made peace with the Jewish people and they accepted the seven uh, mitzvahs of Noah, not become Jewish, they accepted the seven mitzvahs of Noah and they accepted taxation and Jewish sovereignty over Eretz Israel. they in fact were allowed to live in Eretz Israel. So you could have a number of Canaanites continuing to live in the land, but then the question now becomes, and now your question gets reinstated, but shouldn't they have been transposed and uh, moved around 
in the time of Sancheirev? I don't know. Uh, all I can say is that, number one, it's not entirely clear that halacha accepts uh, DNA testing as conclusive, which is one thing. We just don't accept it as a proof. Uh, and number two, every rule could have exceptions, meaning to say um, there may indeed be a, a small number of kananim that were still around, and there may indeed have been a small number of, Am of uh, uh, Ammonites and Moabites that were still around, but they would be mixed in with a much larger grouping coming from other places. Over the years, what might have happened is some of those other groupings died out, leaving them as a remnant, but in fact, they may have only been a small remnant of a much larger original population. So the fact that you can identify some Canaanite in modern Lebanon uh, does not mean that most of the Canaanim uh, were, were taken elsewhere and intermingled. So you really cannot prove it from the relatively smaller populations that you have today. Yeah? Uh, what did the Minhagim and the division between Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi be a permanent feature of Judaism forever? Or as we can see, a lot of kind of half Ashkenazi, half Mizrahi kids talking about as more people moving mm -hmm. to Israel, even further along in the Messianic era comes along, real, these Minhagim still exist and the divisions within the Jewish people remain. Yeah, th that's a very, very interesting question. Uh, we have, of course, within the religious world of, of Torah Judaism, we have many, many minhagim. Uh, we have uh, Ashkenaz and Svarad and Eidot HaMizrach are the big ones. And then within, within each group, there are many, many subdivisions. Uh, you have Ashkenazi, you have uh, Polish minhagim and Galicianer minhagim and uh, Hungarian minhagim. And then among the Svardim, you know, you have Tunisia and Morocco and Syria, and Iraqi, or Eidot HaMizrach, etc. And then uh, you have Hasidic Minhagim, many, many different groups of, of Hasidim and the like. So if you subdivide it, you might have, I don't know, over a hundred different varieties of different things that are going on. And sometimes people say, oh, it's not right that there's such disunity in Am Yisrael. But one thing you have to understand, yeah, it is not right that there's disunity. That's not a good thing. But diversity of minhagim is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a sign of beauty and vibrancy. And each grouping has its own derech and its own way of serving Hashem. I've mentioned many times, many times, the medrash that says the beauty of a garden is primarily when you have different colors of flowers. So the truth of the matter is, as long as this difference does not turn into machlokes, sinas chinam, rivalry and denigration, uh, we shouldn't necessarily work that everybody should be united. All of these minhagim have a place. During World War II, when Rav Chaim Eiser, at the beginning of World War II, when he, met, when he, when he orchestrated the uh, movement of many yeshivos out of Lithuania to Shanghai and then to Japan, right? Uh, Mir was there and the like. So Mir, of course, was a big yeshiva. But there were a lot of little yeshivas, you know, 10 people here and 20 people here. And there was some thought that perhaps for econo economic reasons, we ought to consolidate the yeshivas. Instead of having five yeshivas with 10 talmidim in different places, let's make it one yeshiva of 50 and the like. They say Rav Chaim Eiser was against it. He said each yeshiva has its own uniqueness, its own tam, its own particular approach. We shouldn't try to homogenize it by combining everybody, everybody together. So in that sense, you need to understand that the diversity of minhagim in Klal Yisrael is actually something beautiful. So then the question becomes, well, is that going to last uh, when Mashiach comes? Uh, and we'll have a Sanhedrin, number one, which will give definitive psak halacha. Will there still be these differences of, of minhagim? It is a good question. Uh, my guess is, my guess, I don't have a raya, is that it will continue because uh, this is considered to be, as I say, a testimony to the beauty of Am Yisrael, in which there are many, many different approaches within Torah, within Torah, to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why should that be abolished? Why should we get rid of it? Now, you should know that in Israel, every once in a while, there has been a concerted effort to abolish. Uh, when, when Rav Gorin, a very controversial guy, Rav Gorin, uh, was a chief rabbi of Israel, but before that, his main career was 
He was the chief rabbi of the IDF, of the uh, Israeli army. And um, again, he, he was, he's very, very controversial. I don't want to go over it. I mean, he was a tremendous genius. He was an Eloi. He was an extremely brilliant Talmud Chacham. But uh, let us say he was very innovative and creative in ways that sometimes uh, Gedolim did not approve of. But he, you know, he, w he went his own way. And one of the things he wanted to do is, for the army, he wanted to create a unified Nusach, combining Ashkenaz and Svarad, that there shouldn't be Svardim, and there shouldn't be Ashkenazim, there should only be Jews, Nusach Achid. Uh, but again, uh, that fell apart, because people want to hold on to their Minhagim. It's important to them. It gives them a kesher to their past and to their roots. Uh, in the United States, there was a time when you had all these different immigrants. If we go back to the middle of the 1800s, where there was an attempt to create what was called Nusach America, in which, you know, let's look at Ashkenaz, look, let's look at Svart, and let's pick the best features, whatever that means, the best features of both, and we'll create a sitter that everybody can daven from. But again, those things were not successful for good reason, that there is something. And again, the precedent to it, although it's not an exact analogy, is the idea of tribes. It's very clear from the Torah and from the Nevi'im that the concept of tribes was very important in Qal Yisrael. Every tribe had its own nasi. Every tribe had its own flag. Every tribe had its own encampment in the Midbar. And of course, coming to Eretz Yisrael, every tribe had its own distinct portion of Eretz Yisrael. Now, you might wonder at first glance, why is that an important aspect of Jewish classification? I mean, isn't, what's the difference? Ami Yisachar, your Zavolin, and your Ruvain, and your Shimon, who cares? Isn't the only thing that's important is that we're Jewish? Why should, now, all right, so today we're not really so conscious of tribes because we don't even know our tribe, unless you're a Kohen or a Levi. But in the time of the Beis Hamikdash, the Bayes Risha, not the Bayes Shani, this was a real important thing. And the question is, why is it important? Isn't it counterproductive? Aren't you introducing another factor of disunity? Don't we have enough things to fight over? So now we're going to fight over, my tribe is better than your tribe. And the short answer is, the Medrash tells us that each Shevet had its own unique approach in Avodah Hashem, uh, whether it's Yisachar, Zavolin, etc. And the notion is, Hashem does not want Achdus to be based on sameness and conformity, but it should be an achtos in which each one of us serves Hashem individually and uniquely. And that's why the way Ruvain does it is not the way Shimon does it. I mentioned this morning, right, the idea that every Shevet may have had its own Sefer Torah, slightly different. I said it from the Commander Rebbe. So this is a long-winded answer, so I, I think there will still be a preservation of these unique minhagim, because they are part of the beauty of how Klal Yisrael serves Hashem. In other words, instead of looking at it as a weakness, as a defect that has to be surmounted, it is something to celebrate in the sense of how we serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu that way. Uh, yeah? In other words, can we judge L'Kaf uh, the Orthodox Jews who go to the Harabayas? Yeah. Oh, you want 1,000%. Uh, now again, I... I myself do not go to the Harabayas, and anyone that asks me, I will pass and they should not go in the Harabayas. But to say that there's no tzad zechus for those who go to the Harabayas is absolutely incorrect, because once again, what, what is the question? What is the, putting aside the politics of it, which may be <laughs> a major concern, what is the problem, so to speak, with going to the Harabayas? The problem is essentially tuma, meaning all of us today have been in contact with a dead body in a cemetery once in our lives. And until we are sprinkled with the ashes of para aduma, which we don't have, we remain Tomei. Going to the mikvah is not going to help. You have to have uh, the ashes of para aduma. So as a result, I am a Tomei mace, right? That's a given. We're all Tomei mace. And then the problem is a Tomei mace is not allowed to enter uh, what is called the courtyard, the azara of the Beis Amikdash. But here is the thing. Not every part of the Harabayas has the Kedusha Samikdash. The outer parts of the Harabayas have the halacha of Machna Leviyah, 
Machna Leviyah, meaning it's like a Levite camp. And the halacha is that a Tame Mace, now, now, now a Stam Tame Mace uh, is allowed to go in Machna Levia, um, at least the Oraisa, uh, and uh, the only problem is Machna Shechina. So the only reason why, why they, you're given a Psak that we shouldn't go in the Harabayas is because of the uncertainty of where the boundaries are, meaning the, exactly where Machna Shechina begins might be a little problematical. So it's like walking in a minefield. We tell a person, you know, you don't tell a person, oh, you know, as long as you keep six, inch, six inches away from this place, you're going to be perfectly safe. Well, you know, you don't walk in a minefield that you're six inches away from a, a live mine. Now, those who go to the Harabayas, uh, based, they have psukim that are confident where the Azorah begins, and they will tell you you're not allowed to go beyond a certain point. So I, I cannot say that they're wrong. Uh, they have a shita regarding the mivna, the layout of the base of the base of Mikdash, and that's it. Now they do bring historical evidence that they want to claim that the Rambam, who had been in Eretz Israel as a teenager, went on the Harabayas, etc., from various letters. Uh, it's inconclusive. I don't think you can bring definite rias to that. But to say that there's no tzad of zechus for the people that go. Uh, that's why not. That's why not the case. Uh, even though the halacha is that we should not go. Yeah. Well, this question reminded me of something. So I have a. I know someone close to me that that went with one of his friends to the Harabayas. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone told him about don't go here, don't go there. Yeah. So in a case like this, there are many cases where someone did something wrong, someone close to you they care about, and uh, they don't know. How are you supposed to address the situation? Are you supposed to tell them something, or are you supposed to? Well, there is, of course, a mitzvah in the Torah, which is very hard to, mitzvah to do, called when I see a person do something wrong, I'm supposed to correct them, I'm supposed to give them musr, I'm supposed to give them guidance. But the problem is that in many, many cases, the Gemara, the Gemara already comments that somebody asked Rabbi Akiva, how come today nobody knows how to accept musr? And Rabbi Akiva answers, because nobody knows how to give Musser. Uh, this is a very, very difficult skill. You know, I start criticizing you and saying, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? You know, most of the time a person is going to resent it, a person is going to get angry, and if anything, the person may reject, uh, may become less religious. In other words, you're not going to make him more religious, you're going to make him less religious because he wants to get away from the negativity. So on one hand, there is a mitzvah of tochecha, but on the other hand, sometimes you've got to be quiet. The way Chazal express it is, the same way there is a mitzvah to say something that will be listened to, kishem shemitzvah leimar davar hanishma, it's a mitzvah shalo leimar davar she'eno nishma. Things that are not going to be listened to, it is better to be quiet because giving musr will be destructive and counter counterproductive. Um, you know, it says in Perkei Avos, when Perkei Avos enumerates the 48 ways that you acquire the Torah, so one of those ways is, Ohe vesatochacha, you love tochacha. I think people mistranslate it. People think that means, I love to give musr. Sure, I look around and I see all the stuff that you guys are doing. I love to correct you. But that's not what it means. <laughs> does not mean I love to correct other people. It means I love when somebody points out to me how I could be better. And that's a very high, that's a very high madrega. That's a high madrega. That I love when someone can point out how I could be a better person. That's a myla. But you're not supposed to love to give tochacha to people. So... The basic idea is, it depends on your relationship with the person. If he knows you love him or you care about him, and you're able to talk to him about this and he will not get angry or upset, then by all means, you should talk to him about it. Uh, and if you feel you're not able, maybe you can find a Rebbe or somebody else who might be able to do it. But if uh, the only thing that's gonna happen is he's gonna get angry and resentful and uh, write you off, then it's often better not, not to say anything. Uh, now, the Harabayas thing is, is a hard thing to give Musr about. I mean, there, I mean, the reason simply is, is because there are from people who go, 
and even in our neighborhood, uh, there are people uh, who are advocates of this, and, and indeed they sometimes uh, talk to the Or Sameach uh, uh, Talmidim about it, and we're not very, the Rabbeim are not very happy about, about it. So it's a hard thing, but, but Lamaisa, all I can tell you is I, I'm, not, I'm not, as I said, I'm not Mavato, the people that go to the Harabayas, because there is a halachic justification, but I think the Justification on the other side just happens to be stronger. And it, it is the Mahalach of the Gedolim that, you know, if a Tame goes, onto the, goes into the Azara, the Azara area, they are Chay of Karis. You're dealing with the Chay of Karis Mamish. And therefore, if you're dealing with the Chay of Karis Mamish, it behooves you to err on the side of being Machmer and not going. But as they say, uh, those who go are more confident in their identification of what is the Azara. And what is not the answer? Yeah. Uh, the spokesperson, uh, a believer, finds out definitively that he's actually not Jewish. Does he have an obligation to this? Yeah, that's an interesting question. If, uh, if, a, from, if a person who is living a from life uh, discovers that halakhically they're not Jewish, do they have an obligation uh, to convert? I actually don't know where there would be such an obligation if a person discovers. <laughs> They're a goy, so they're not Jewish, and a non-Jew never has an obligation uh, to convert, so they're uh, free to live life as a goy. Uh, an interesting question is, will they get rewarded in Shemayim? Like if, let's say for 30 years, they were putting on tefillin, uh, they were keeping Shabbos, they were keeping kosher, uh, they were learning Torah, they were saying Kriya Shema. Uh, and now, it can be very devastating. Is it all a waste? Does it mean, you know, I did nothing? So there are two possible answers to that. Answer number one might actually be a very, very intriguing halacha in the Rambam, which is very, very difficult, but the Rambam brings it halacha. The Rambam says that although a guy is not supposed to keep Shabbos complete, that Shabbos is a little different, but the Rambam says a guy is permitted to take on any positive commandment in the Torah and he will get reward as an Eino Mitzvah. He's not commanded, but even an Eino Mitzvah gets a certain amount of reward. So it doesn't mean it's a zero. It means he'll get the reward of an Eino Mitzvah V'yaisa. According to the Rambam, a guy could put on tefillin if he wanted to. And a guy would get sechar in Shemayim for putting on tefillin. That's quite, quite extraordinary, uh, that, that such a thing. I mean, we don't, we, don't, we don't seem to follow that practice. In fact, even when somebody is in the process of converting, We'll often tell them, don't put on tefillin until either after the conversion or right before. But according to the Rambam, a stam guy who did, doesn't convert. Say, I want to put on tefillin, l'shem shemayim. So one comfort you can give to the person is, listen, you st you've still done things as an enum mitzvah And there might be another comfort I can give the person that might even be stronger. That is, the Gemara says, if a person intended to do a mitzvah, and it turned out he didn't, but since his thought was to do a mitzvah, Hashem treats the machshava tova as if it was a maisa. So that would mean if I thought I was Jewish and I did the mitzvahs, my machshava tova is considered to be a maisa. So that would even mean he'd get reward as a Jew. But in terms of a chiv to become a Jew, I don't see a chiv to become a Jew. By the way, I, I, I actually faced questions like this uh, in the other direction. And that is uh, when I was a, a, a rub in, in Maryland, in Silver Spring, Maryland. So we had a lovely family of, of people who were B'nai, B'nos Torah, very, very from. But at some point it turned out that the mother, the mother was the daughter of a woman who converted many, many years before. And uh, that woman was not always a Shomer Shabbos, and there was some question that was raised about her conversion. Now, you understand that if her conversion was not valid, that means her daughter's, her daughter, her daughter didn't have a conversion. Her daughter was born from her, so grandma, right, grandma is not Jewish. That means mother is not Jewish. That means kids in Kolel are not Jewish. That means their kids are not Jewish. I mean, you have a ripple. Well, okay, that may not be the case. In other words, the um, the sons who marry Jewish women, the kids will be Jewish, but at least the daughters, every, all, all the daughters are not Jewish. So 
my instinctive reaction, and this is something I learned as a young Rav, is, well, listen, not a big problem. Uh, just go to the mikvah now. The girls were not married yet. Go to the mikvah now, do what is called a gior l'chumra, and that way you got no problems. In other words, if there's some question, you're a single girl, and if there's some question, was your grandmother's conversion valid? That's a very easily solvable issue. Go to the mikvah now and convert. And looking at it just in terms of a problem, yeah, very simple. It's a very simple problem to solve. But what I didn't realize at the time, I didn't realize how emotionally devastating it is to tell a 22-year-old woman who has been living as a from girl all of her life yeah. that maybe she's not Jewish. And the feeling, I remember the feeling about all the mitzvos that I've done down the drain. You know, there's, there's a, there is a psychological dimension here that just to say mechanically, oh, go to the mikvah, everything will be fine. Well, what was I until I go to the mikvah? So it does happen that people discover sometimes that they might not be Jewish. Sometimes they discover they're not Jewish at all. Uh, it, does, it does happen. Of course, the opposite happens as well. There are people who lived lives as non-Jews who discovered they were Jewish. Uh, I remember in, in Silver Spring uh, talking to a priest who somehow discovered that he was actually Jewish. He wasn't going to do anything about it because he was, <laughs> he was happy where he was. But they said, yeah, yeah, my, my, I discovered my mother was Jewish and you know, she converted to Catholicism or, or, or whatever it is. So you have both sides of the equation on that particular uh, issue. Yeah. Can one request um, the difference of inflation on a loan? Yeah, uh, this is actually a very, very uh, interesting question. Uh, there is, of course, an issue in the Torah that if a Jew lends money to another Jew, uh, you're not allowed to charge interest. So I can't lend you $100 and stipulate that you pay me uh, even a 1% interest and the like. But the question becomes, what if uh, due to inflation, uh, I mean the, ri the rising of prices for things, it turns out that a dollar can only uh, buy less. As I give you a dollar that could buy you know, a whole bunch of stuff, by the time you pay me the dollar, because of inflation, the dollar can only buy 50% of what it could buy before. So my argument is, I'm not charging you interest to make a profit. I'm charging you interest to simply get back the same amount of money that I lent you. In other words, the same purchasing power. Um, I mean, for example, let's make up a number. Let's assume that a dollar could purchase a loaf of bread. And by the time you pay me the dollar, bread has gone up to two dollars. So I'm basically saying I gave you enough money to buy a loaf of bread. Give me enough money to buy a loaf of bread. And if that means you're giving me two dollars, that's just, just, that's just because of inflation. In fact, an, an economist will actually tell you that any rate of interest that is equal or lower than the rate of inflation is bechlal not interest, because interest is supposed to be a profit on the lending of money. So that's a very excellent economic point. It has halachically no validity at all, uh, which means to say interest is a very mechanical rule. We don't look at purchasing power. We don't look at uh, the money losing its purchasing power due to inflation. I lend you a dollar. You give me a dollar. If you give me a dollar a ten, even if the inflation is 200 percent, that halachically is considered interest. So uh, the logic of the question is well, you know, I, I understand the logic of it, but halacha does not work with that. Uh, yeah. Have you ever seen the, the, the portrait, the, the topic in the last week's parsha where the Torah says to say that Yitzchak was being misconfigured with Rivka Yisro? Um, and it seems very out of line, very out of character. For, and Rashi says how he was just got in touch and came to Torah and found the So what, what's the idea of that? Yeah, there are, there are sometimes uh, expressions or events that are described in Tanakh that's a little hard for us to imagine. Uh, if you remember the uh, story in Parshas Toldos, uh, when Yitzchak is living among the Philistines, among the Plishtim, so uh, once again, like Avram, he told Rivka to say, you're my sister, uh, lest you, uh, in order that I shouldn't be killed. And uh, Rivka was taken to Avimelech, although they, no one slept with her. But how did Avimelech discover that Yitzchak was in fact married to Rivka? Because it says that he saw through the window, through the window, I guess the window was not 
closed or covered, that Yitzchak was playing, mitzachek, Yitzchak was playing or laughing with Rivka, his wife, and uh, Rashi in the, from Chazal say this is a euphemism for their having sexual relations, and as a result, uh, Avimelech knew that this was his wife, and then he said to Yitzchak, why did you say this? You could have caused us to sin, and we would have been punished by God, etc. So the question becomes, you know, uh, Yitzchak Avinu is uh, one of the other sakitashim, and Bichlal, if a person is engaged in marital intimacy, uh, this should be something that's sanua, and it shouldn't be a situation where somebody can walk by the window of your house and look and see uh, what is what is going on. Um, I, I don't have a clear shot, but but it it could be maybe a different image. See, the image that you might get by reading the Chumash is like there's this open window, and I'm just casually walking by, and I look in and I see what you're doing, and that would indeed not be Sanua. But it may it may be an opposite type of idea that maybe there were like spies there. Maybe Yitzchak everything was Sanua. But looking through the window, that might be the expression. That might be the euphemism that there was some uh, spies. Avimelech may have suspected something and was invading the privacies. But I don't know. It is, uh, it is a difficult issue. One thing you do see, though, that's very important as a side point, and that is the physical intimacy of husband and wife is considered to be something holy and something good. Uh, it's not considered to be something negative in any way. And perhaps, B'derech Agav, the Torah wanted to be Merames, that even Yitzchak Avinu, who was considered to be the most removed from Olam Hazah, kind of the separated person, the person who was a korban to Hashem, the person who was an Akeda, still continued to be uh, with, his, with his wife, and that was proper. That, that, that makes the idea of Moshe Rabbeinu very, very interesting, very intriguing. We know that in Christianity, at least among the Catholics, the notion is a holy person is supposed to be celibate. And indeed, uh, Paul says in the Christian Bible that the reason why regular people are allowed to marry is it is better to marry than to burn. Meaning to say, people have sexual urges, you're going to go to hell, so at least marriage is a way that will give you a heter, so to speak. But ideally, if you're really kadosh, don't get married. Just, just be with boys instead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> forgive me. I, 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 don't, I don't mean to be anti, anti-Catholic in particular. Um, so, so the thing is that Judaism is very much the opposite. The very first mitzvah in the Torah is to be fruitful and multiply. And celibacy is not only not required, it is considered to be a sinful state. Now, the big kasha we do have is Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, indeed, was celibate at a certain point. I mean, he was married, he had two sons, but from Matan Taira onwards, for the rest of his life, which is another 40, 40 years, uh, he was separated from his wife. Now, you'll recall, Aaron and Miriam were critical of him for doing that, and yet, and Hashem didn't tell him either. The Gemara in Shabbos says, this was a decision he made on his own that Hashem agreed to after Moshe did it. Hashem did not command him to be celibate. But all I can say is that Moshe Rabbeinu is, is, is a unique case. Moshe Rabbeinu was like an angel. Moshe Rabbeinu had to be prepared for Nevoah 24-7. And the one thing I can say is that Chazal never used Moshe's behavior as a role model that we are supposed to imitate. He had, his, he had a special madrega. It has no shaykhs to us. And Chazal does, do not consider it a desirable midah to emulate. And that, that itself is an important uh, teaching, that we consider the chibur of ish ishtai within the context of Kedushan to be a dover kadesh. And the tsenius involved is not because it's shameful, but because it's kadesh. And therefore, the more holy something is, the more private. Now, where do I get this? The Ramban himself, Ramban, wrote a sefer on the intimacy of husband and wife, and it's called Igeres HaKadosh. Ramban wrote this, and the Ramban says this. The Ramban says that all of the inyanim of Tzniyos is not because this is a Dover Maguna, but because it is a Dover Kadesh. And things that are Kadesh have to have a certain amount of Tzniyos in the, in the world.
Yeah. So this is uh, in, the, in next week's parsha. So Lavan chases after Yaakov, and after not finding the <coughs> idols that you know that Rachel stole from her father, so um, Yaakov kind of gives it to Lavan, like you know you. Why are you accusing me of all this stuff? You know, I, I was only honest the entire time I was working for you. You cheated me all, right? So, and you said, like, I only took a loss for myself. So, um, I, I was wondering, like, what was Yaakov hoping to gain from, you know, kind of blowing up, kind of, <laughs> to Lavan? And uh, what could we learn from that interaction in terms of, like, dealing with shady people like Lavan? Right, right. So, again, uh, when Yaakov finally manages to, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, leave Haran, and Lavan is chasing after him, and they finally meet, and uh, Yaakov finally explodes and gives Lavan uh, uh, a speech. So the question is, what's going on? Did Yaakov simply lose his temper? That, that is one possibility. You know, at some point, you know, you get frustrated. <laughs> I've been here for 20 years, you know, listen, <laughs> and the like, and uh, I have a reason to be angry. The other might be that maybe Yaakov is trying to give Lavan Musr. Maybe Yaakov feels at this particular juncture that Lavan could be Makabel Tochacha. Lamaisa, that didn't work either, but, but you could indeed understand Yaakov as perhaps trying to give Lavan a Tochacha. Uh, so depending on how you understand it, there's one of two lessons you could learn. <laughs> one lesson is, I'll be pshat, although well, this may not be politically correct, that even a Yaakov Avinu can sometimes get impatient. It can happen that these are the, na it's the nature of life, that sometimes we lose it a little bit. Or the other pshat would be the other way, that even a Russia like Lavan might be amenable to Teichacha, and therefore it's worthwhile to communicate it to someone. Right? So you can learn opposite lessons depending on how you understand the story. Yeah? Uh, what is the standard uh, for men when it comes to men's sneas? Yeah, men's sneas. This is a new, a new invention. It's been ignored for a pretty long time. Uh, whenever people think about sneos, they always think about uh, the sleeves of women, and women do this, and women do that, and, uh, you know, a bus, they sit in the back of the bus, or the front of the bus, depending on how you enter the bus, and the like. Men, men can do whatever they want, right? Men, sneos, nothing, nothing to do with men. So the truth of the matter is, that absolutely is not true, and it's not true for two reasons. One reason is that sneos bichlal is not limited to how you dress. Tzniyas is a certain attitude that I serve Hashem with modesty and humility without showing off with gaiva. So this is an attitude. Lavush is a manifestation of that attitude of humility. But the humility that I'm omeid lefnei Hashem, of course men and women both have to have it. That's one thing. But the second thing is that even in terms of dress, even in terms of lavush, there are halachas regarding Sinias of men, and indeed, just recently, just the past maybe six months, the uh, past half year, uh, there were a number of G'daylam who signed a proclamation about the shameful way that religious men, you know, you don't get that that often, but religious men dressing in terms of uh, how tight their clothing is, in terms of, I don't want to maybe be too detailed, in terms of uh, parts of their anatomy that uh, were showing, uh, and how this is a pirza and a shanda and a cherpa, and uh, it is a violation of walking uh, before Hashem with ema and yira. So there, indeed, there are there are halachas. However, however, it is true that the halachas regarding men are not as chomer; they're not as extensive as the halachas regarding women. With respect to women, for example, we have rules, you know, covering at least the uh, elbow and covering the knee. Uh, if a man were to walk around in loose shorts and uh, tank top, he would not be transgressing anything. In other words, uh, what, what would be a violation of tzniyas for women would not be a violation of tzniyas for men. Uh, with men, it basically would be things that accentuate or reveal the genitalia. That, that's basically it. Anything beyond that is not with hilchos tzniyas. But you do have another idea that any person who feels that they're in the presence of Hashem should, uh, you know, should not dress in a manner that's uh, overly casual, overly familiar, overly revealing. So I wouldn't say it's usher, but it's not the proper hanhaga 
of a of a ben Torah. So men's sneas is is actually an important uh, issue that we need to be to be aware of. Yeah. So, <clears throat> despite the you know obviously huge genius of the of the rabbeim and the, especially in the Talmud and the, and the Rishonim and everything, we don't really find a lot of. Um, like scientific discovery and experimentation. Although you do, there is one Gemara, I forgot the name of the rabbi, that he did some experiment, if the bird, if some sort of bird could regrow its feathers, for some reason he did some sort of experiment with that. But we really don't see like a lot of uh, emphasis on scientific advancement in, you know, among Chazal, the rabbis in general. So I was wondering like, what is the place of science and like scientific discovery in the in the Jewish world. Yes, let me let me share with you a, a, a beautiful machshava from a Shimshon of Hirsch. It's actually relevant to Hanukkah coming up. If you remember when Noah after the Noah after the Mabel got drunk, he planted a vineyard, he got drunk, uh, his nakedness became exposed, and Chum uh, wanted to make fun of it. Maybe Chum did even worse, but whatever it was. And Chum called his brother Shem and Yefes. Let's go see what uh, Noah, our father, looks like. And Shem and Yefes did not want to shame their father. So they took a blanket and they walked backwards and they covered their father's nakedness so he should not be humiliated. And after that, when Noah woke up and Noah realized what happened, he gave both Shem and Yefes a bracha. And he said to Yefes, Yaft Eleikim, it's a pun, Yaft Eleikim Li Yefes. Hashem should give beauty to Yefes, the Yishkain, and he should dwell, the Ohale Shame, in the tense of shame. Now, in English, that sounds bad, tense of shame, but it means shame is a person. He should dwell in the tense of shame. So listen to what Rav Hirsch says. Rav Hirsch says, Yefes, is actually the ancestor of Yavan, Greece. Shem is the ancestor of Klal Yisrael. Noach is identifying to those two sons. Ham got cursed, but Shem and Yefes are given two different missions in the world. Yefes is given the mission of creating physical beauty. And physical beauty manifests itself in many, many ways. It could be art, could be science, to be philosophy, literature. The kayach of generating yaifi in the world was given to Yefes. Shame was given the job of creating Kedusha in the world by connection to HaKadosh Baruch This was Noach's division of labor. Now, when, when Noach says Hashem should give beauty to Yefes, he means Hashem should give Yefes the kayach to create this beauty but only if Yefes uses his beauty within the tense of Shem, meaning he uses his beauty within the context of glorifying Hashem. So when the beauty, which includes the science and the, mathema and the mathematics and the music and the literature, is used to be able to serve Hashem in a better way, then it becomes beauty. When it is separated from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then it becomes something evil, Yavan. In fact, um, the Maral points out, take the word Yavan. Now, Yavan is Yud, Vav, Nun. As a verb, Yud, Vav, Nun means oppression. But if you reverse the letters, it spells Noi. So the beauty becomes an oppression when it's divorced from Torah. So. The, the short answer, I think, to your, not to such a short answer, but the answer to your question is that Chazal were not scientists, per se, because they understood that there was a world of Greece and Rome that were in doing the science. Chazal knew the science of their times, and Chazal used the science of their times, but they did not see their role to be actively engaged in scientific endeavor they saw their role to create Kedusha through the teachings of Torah and uh, the mitzvos and the like. So the same way that, you know, you don't uh, say to a lawyer, you know, why don't you do surgery? I mean, there is a division of labor. This is exactly the division of labor that goes all the way back to Nayak. It was Yavan's job to do this, and it's our job to do this. And when Yavan connects to what we're doing, 
That becomes a good and noble thing. When Yavan disassociates from what we're doing, it becomes a destructive thing. That's the story of Hanukkah and, and, and Antiochus. So the truth is, uh, it's very, very clear that Chazal were absolutely conversant with the science of their times, but not necessarily more than the science of their times. Meaning to say, uh, when you read something in Chazal that scientifically appears to be incorrect, you shouldn't just say, oh, Chazal, God forbid, are so primitive. And, um, by and large, you can always trace it to Aristotle or some Greek or Roman thing. Meaning, they were current. They were absolutely current with the science of their times. And sometimes, they, sometimes, not always, they went beyond the science of their times. But their scientific statements are not part of the Messiah, are not part of the Messiah of Teresh Shabal Ped. This is an old teaching of Rav Haigon and Rav Avram ben Arambam. So we are not mechayev to accept their scientific observations as, as Torah. Okay, that's, uh, that's an important point as well. And that's a little bit of a controversy uh, today where people will tell you every single scientific statement that I'll make, you're mechayev to be makabel. Uh, Rav Avram ben Arambam uh, says no. And Rav Haigain, uh earlier also says no because uh, as scientists, they were working with the science of the, of the time. But it wasn't their primary interest. It was not their interest. Uh, they benefited from it. They used it. They knew it. But their job was to create Kedusha in the world. And that's what they focused on. Yeah? Um, I don't know how we relate to um, Leav, like his wife, but <coughs> at, least in, at least in Chazal, um, more of like the phrases that we hear, it's, like about, um, it's more about like really about Rambam's character and, and their mature methods. And we have the Tarsha, like where, where Leah starts speaking to Rambam and says, like, she's my husband, and speaks in such a strong way. Uh, obviously, she was the mother of most of the Shvatim. And uh, I just want to know, I guess, like, yeah, uh, how do we understand these things? And how do we relate to Leah and Zena? Well, you know, th there's one um, indisputable fact that you can't get away with. And number one, Leah is the mother of six of the 12 Shvatim. And if you include uh, Zilpa as part of her brood, eight of the 12 uh, Shvatim. And Leah is the one that is buried next to Yaakov Avinu in Ma'ara Samach Pela. Rachel, his beloved wife Rachel, is not. By the way, just uh, how old do you think Rachel was when she died? It's quite, quite amazing. She, Rachel was around uh, 32, according to the see, a very, very young woman. She, she had one, well, she had Yosef, and then she had Binyamin, and she died in childbirth. And she was, so, now remember, Yaakov lived many, many, many years after Rachel. But you see that the memory of Rachel never left him, even on his deathbed. On his deathbed, he's talking about Rachel. It was more than 70 years uh, since Rachel had, had died. So Rachel, in many ways, is a tragic figure because Yaakov worked seven years for Rachel, didn't get her, worked another seven years, and uh, she died like, pretty, pretty quickly after, after they were married. Uh, Leah is also a tragic figure. Leah gave him children. Leah was faithful to him. Leah, most of Klal Yisrael comes from Leah. David HaMelech comes from Leah. Mashiach comes from Leah. Um, Le and, and Kohanim, right, also, right? The Kahuna comes from, Kahuna and Malchus come from Leah, Shevet, Shevet Levi. And yet, Leah describes herself as being a hated woman. She saw that she was hated. Hated? How do you understand that? Is it possible that Yaakov hated her? So the Mephorshim all say that the Torah is using a very strong language, but hated is to be understood in a relative sense, not an absolute sense. Of course, he loved Rachel, he loved Leah. But because he loved Rachel so much more than Leah, so Leah felt Sanua. And this Yaakov was a good husband to Leah too. But again, if you just look at it from a psychological standpoint, Leah was living with a tremendous amount of pain. She had a sense of being rejected. And in fact, some Midrashim connect the idea. It says in Kaihelis, Elohim Yavakesh Asanirdaf. Hashem always sides with the underdog. 
the one that's pursued, the one that is looked down upon. And that's the Shtikl Remez, why Leah is buried next to Yaakov. Elohim Yevakesh es Hanirdef. So, if Leah, yeah, and maybe, you know, I know we don't, we don't, we always want to analyze things at the highest level of Sitkas, but the truth is, the feep shot, if Leah expresses her anguish that you're taking away uh, my husband, uh, it's understandable. It's understandable. Because in some ways, Rachel did take him away in terms of affection of who, who Yaakov cared for more. But you also have to understand, too, that both Rachel and Leah understood that their relationship to Yaakov is not just a matter of a husband. It's a matter of creating an eternal nation of Am Yisrael. And any time any one of their halakim is going to be diminished, this is a cosmic repercussion that has eternal ramifications. It's a big deal. It's not just, you know, a wife and a husband. It's a nation. It's an eternity. It's a mission. It's a purpose of the world, a purpose of the universe. You're trying to take away my chalak by, by doing, by, you know, having more time with him, etc. So as a result, the reactions are going to be much more intense than we might expect or even justify in a one-to-one -one situation. You know, like Rachel was the one who gave over the Simonim to Leah, and if it wasn't for her giving it to her, then she... That's true. That, that, that is a good question, because ultimately Rachel uh, was the one that gave Leah the means, the wherewithal. That, that is a good question. But still, I guess it gets counterbalanced by the feelings of alienation that Leah feels. By the way, I, I saw a beautiful, beautiful shot on why Rachel wanted the flowers. And really, it can actually make you cry on both sides of it. Ruvain brought Dudaim to his mother. Dudaim are certain flowers, jasmine, whatever it would be. Rachel sees the Dudaim, and she wants the Dudaim. And she asks to have some of the Dudaim, and that's when Leah screams at her and says, hey, you've taken my husband. You want to take my Dudaim. And finally, they traded a night. And as Rachel gave up a night to have the Dudaim. Why are the Dudaim so important? All right, so there are a lot, a lot of Midrashim. But one of the Pshatim is this. Rachel herself, I mean, you see, this is like sadness on both sides. Leah is a fertile woman who feels rejected. Rachel is not rejected, but Rachel has no children. So Rachel's feeling is, if I can't have children, let me have the flowers that Ruvain brought to his mother. So when I look at these flowers, I'll think of a child bringing things to his mother. And it'll be a way that I could be comforted a little bit. By Just like, you know, a person sometimes will look at the picture, a person who doesn't have children may look at the picture of someone else's children to give them a little chisa. So, this is really a very, very sad story, a very, very moving story. Here you have the rejected wife, and here you have the childless woman. And the childless woman wants to hold on to something that will remind her of children in the house. And the rejected wife, you know, feels that you're rejecting, you know, you're causing, you're taking even that away from me, so to speak. And that's kind of what, kind of what is going on, you know. So again, I know, <laughs> this is what I'm saying, it's a little controversial in the sense that people always want to turn the avos and the ima. Okay, I'm going to get in trouble there. Okay, no hate mail, please. Uh, we, 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 the tendency of modern, not modern, but the tendency of yeshivasha, shiur man chumish, is to look at the avos and imos on a very abstract level. We look at them as certain abstractions of righteousness. And therefore we'll analyze what they're doing at a very high, high, high level. And of course that's MS, because the Avos and the Imaos are, are you know, madregas that we have no idea. But that also means whenever it comes to looking at genuine human emotions that people in crisis have, we say, oh, we can't talk about that. We can't talk about sadness. We can't talk about feeling rejected. We can't talk about marital alienation, because that's reducing the Avos and the Imaos to our problems. I don't know if that's true. 
Of course the Avos and Imos are totally beyond our Madregas. But that doesn't mean they didn't have these issues on some level as well. So again, no, please, no, no mail on this. Um, so I'm willing, I'm perfectly willing to look at the Chumash and see these aspects of what's going on as well. I think it's legitimate, and I think HaKadosh Baruch Hu is communicating these images to us because these are lessons that we take in our own shalom bias and our own relationship to our spouses. So it's not the, 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 the typical yeshiva way of approaching the Chumash, but I don't consider it a treif at all. I, I consider it to be a very valuable way of, of looking at the Avos and the Imos. Yeah? Uh, throughout uh, all of like, uh, the Torah world, is it agreed upon by everyone that Hebrew is the original language? I'm sorry, what was the first, first uh, by the Torah world, what did you say? I mean, within the Torah world. Oh, within the Torah world. Does everyone agree that Hebrew is the original language? I, I think that is so. Uh, again, I know um, historians and the like may have <laughs> some different opinions on it. But I think our Masoira is that Lashon HaKadosh was, number one, the language by which Hashem created heaven and earth, and number two was the language that Adam HaRishon spoke, uh, and therefore, by extension, was the language of all humanity until the Tower of Babel, till the Dor HaFlaga, when the languages were split off. Now, what's interesting is, though, that uh, there are some Svarim that tell us that Lashon HaKodesh used to be a much bigger language than, than it is. Meaning to say, when Hashem split off uh, the languages, it's not that He created new languages. Rather, that which once was part of the Hebrew tongue became separated out. And as a result, every single... Now, this wouldn't apply to English or French, which are new languages, but whatever ancestral languages were created among the 70 nations, all of it was Nichlau in Lashon HaKadosh. In fact, that's how they interpret uh, Chazal that Rashi brings on the word totafos, right? We say by tefillin, ukeshartem lios al yodecha, you should bind it as a, uh, on your arm, and it should be totafos, beine necha, phylacteries between your head. Actually, nobody knows what phylactery. This is a clear example where we look to the Hebrew. <laughs> what are phylacteries? Oh, tefillin, right? Right. So, but what does totafos mean? So Rashi brings that uh, it's a composite of two words, tat and pas. Tat means two in Coptic, an African tongue, and pat means two in an African tongue. Right? So it means four, because the Phil and Shul Rosh have four compartments. Why on earth is the Torah telling me something in Coptic or African, whatever language that is? We don't even know exactly what language. I mean, uh, there's no language called African, but uh, some language from Afriki. The answer is because the Torah is teaching you that originally it was part of Hebrew. Originally it was Hebrew, and as a zecher, that all of these breakaway languages had their shoresh in Lashon HaKodesh, that is why the Torah uses sometimes a foreign word to teach you it was originally part of Hebrew. Uh, there's one, one other point about Lashon HaKodesh. Again, you didn't ask this, but I'll, I'll mention it. Derech Agav. Why is uh, the Hebrew language called Lashon HaKadosh, the holy tongue. What is holy about uh, Lashon HaKadosh? So we have a machlekes, the Rambam and the Ramban. The Rambam gives a negative reason. The Rambam says that Hebrew, the Hebrew language, at least biblical Hebrew, has no terms that specifically refer to uh, sexual functions, so there's no obscenity or pornography. And that's even true in modern Hebrew. All pornography or all obscenities in modern Hebrew is from the Arabic. There's a lot of Arabic in modern spoken Hebrew, but uh, Lashon HaKadosh has no swear words, and that's why it's Lashon HaKadosh. That's what the Rambam says. There are no, in fact, that's why the word for sexual intercourse is a euphemism, like bia. Bia means coming, coming together. Shechiva. There's no direct word uh, for, for uh, those things. The Ramban does not like that reason because that's a negative reason. You're saying it's holy because it doesn't have that. The Ramban says what makes Lashon HaKadosh holy, it was, it was the vehicle through which HaKadosh Baruch created heaven and earth. And therefore there is something inherently spiritual that this is the vehicle of creation. And I've mentioned this before, forgive me for repeating, 
you know, Mark Twain has a satirical story making fun of, making fun of the Bible, whatever, he was an atheist. Uh, so he has the story of uh, Adam naming the animals. So in his uh, story, uh, uh, Eve asks him, you know, Adam and Eve will say that's the way he wrote it. Eve asks him, why did you call that thing a lion? Why did you call it a lion? So Adam is angry at her. He says, it looks exactly like a lion. What do you want me to call it? That's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> so that's said as a joke. But you know, here's the thing. If you substitute the Hebrew word, why did you call that an arye? And Adam says, it looks exactly like an arye. That is exactly the right answer, because here's the thing. When we say Hashem created the universe through the letters of the Aleph base, each letter of the Aleph base has a spiritual koach that channels unique energies. And when letters are combined, you have kind of spiritual chemical reactions. Just as when you take two molecules, I'm sorry, two atoms of hydrogen with an atom of oxygen, you get water. So too, when you take the koach of the aleph and you combine it with the koach of the resh and the koach of the yud and the koach of the he, together, those kochos create a lion. So, how did Adam Arishon name animals? He did what's called reverse engineering, like an x-ray vision. He looked at the spiritual letter combinations that gave rise to a lion. The lion comes from the Aleph, Resh, Yud, Hey, in that order. That's its name. So, because of this, the Ran says, that a name in Lashon HaKadosh is the true essence of something. So, for example, if, if, if I call a lion a lion, that doesn't, I mean, I, I don't even know what, where the word lion comes from. It's just a name. It's just a, a made-up thing. But Aryeh is actually the spiritual composition that gives rise to the lion. So, names in Lashon HaKadosh reflect true essences in terms of identifying their spiritual natures, as opposed to names in any other language, which are just conventional. They're just things that were made up uh, to call something, to call something something. So that's the nature of Russian Yeah? Um, why is the only mitzvah say nothing about where applied to other Jews? And it's like really, one should distance themselves. As a matter of fact, you find places that says, my read is, my read. And we read the Malin and, and that we shouldn't return in our beta for a guy. Why, why is it like that? And it only applies within us, as a, even though there's a whole world around us. Right, right. So that, that's, uh, that's uh, again, a good question. We have in the Torah many mitzvahs, bein adam lechaveirai, responsibilities of kindness and compassion and uh, towards other people, not just for Hashem, but bein adam but most, not all, but most of the mitzvahs bin Adam Lechavero apply to the way I must deal with my fellow Jew and may not apply to how I deal with a guy. Now, a lot of the negative things, not stealing, not murdering, that does apply, meaning vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, I can't harm them. I'm not allowed to be mazik them. I'm not allowed to steal. Oh, I realize there's all machlokas and those things too, but lahalacha, I can't steal from a guy, I can't cheat a guy. I can't kill a guy. All of that is true. So I, I can't infringe on them. But once we talk about the benevolence, the chesed, generally speaking, it is primarily towards uh, Jews. And the question is, well, why is that so? Aren't all human beings made in the image of Hashem, which is true, and therefore aren't all human beings entitled to be treated with a great deal of, of kindness? So... One answer that's given, and now this may depend on the situation, is it was a notion of reciprocity, meaning to say, since the umos ha'olam that were over the Avodah Zarah did not show us, would, would not show us any particular kindness, so therefore the Torah did not put chiyuvim on us. Interest is a very good example. You're not going to be able to get a loan from a non-Jewish bank without interest, so I can lend a non-Jew without interest, because uh, I'm sorry, with interest, because he would charge me interest. There's a notion of, of reciprocity. There's one particular idea. 
Another idea, which uh, is a das yachid, I have to say, but um, the Meiri actually wrote uh, the Meiri. And again, some people say this was uh, a forgery. It, it, it's a very controversial. The Meiri has a whole approach that virtually all of the laws which discriminate against Goyim only applied to pagans who were idol worshippers in the ancient world because those pagan cultures murdered and raped and stole and had no sense of morality whatsoever. So the Tyrus says, I don't have to be moral towards them. Masha Enkain de Mi'iri said, the world of Christianity, which was not so benign, there were, this is after the Crusades, but at least officially, they subscribe to the notion of morality and ethics. We are obligated to treat them in a moral and ethical way as well. Now this is a big chiddish. This is actually one of the most controversial points of the Me'iri, in which the Me'iri kind of takes all of the laws against non-Jews, and he says they don't apply to Christians who believe in God. Uh, they only apply to the ancient pagans who had no sense of morality. Now, the Me'iri can make a you know, 21st century politically correct person feel very comfortable. So it's nice to say, it's nice to be aware of the Me'iri. Halachically, I have to be honest, uh, halachically, uh, we don't pass me like the Me'iri, actually, and we don't uh, differentiate, but at least the Me'iri, if that makes you comfortable, at least be aware that there is such a shita of one of the Gedole, Gedole Rishainim. Now, another point, though, is this. Another point is that the Mishnah says in Gittin that we visit the sick of the Ovde Kochavim, even idolaters, we visit the sick, uh, we give them staka, and it says, because of Darche Shalom, because this brings peace to the world. Which means even if the Torah is not Machayavit, Chazal were Machayavit. Now, what's fascinating is, there's a Machlekes Rishainen. What is Darche Shalom? Listen to this. this. This has really interesting ramifications. Rashi says, Darche Shalom is, if we're not nice to the Goyim, they're going to hate us and hurt us, so we better be nice to them. Which means, according to Rashi, we don't really care what happens to them, but, you know, we better be nice because otherwise it can come back to hurt us. So that's how Rashi understands it. The Rambam, when he codifies the Mishnah that you're mavakar chayle of the kechavim, and these are pagans even, and you give staka the, and darche shalom, the Rambam does not say, because otherwise Jews are going to be hurt. The Rambam says, by showing compassion to other human beings, you are bringing peace into the world by emulating the midais of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is rachamav al kol masav. This is really a, a major philosophical difference. According to the Rashi, the way Rashi says it is, I'm not, I mean, there may be other Rashis to consider, but just looking at this one Rashi, Rashi's basically saying, the only people we care about are Jews, but we got to be nice, we got to be charitable, we got to be compassionate, because that way we'll be in a better position. <coughs> so operationally, we'll be nice, but, you know, really, I care about our own. According to the Rambam, there's a broader philosophical issue that Chazal felt we should feel compassion for everybody because that is the midah of Hashem. The way academics describe it, there's a lot of academic writing on this, they describe Rashi's view as a particularistic view and the Rambam's view as a more universalistic view in the sense of your ethical consciousness. But I do want to mention something that um, I once heard from Yaakov Kamenetsky, but then I saw that it's actually a ton of veil yo. I don't think he mentioned it in the name of the Medrash. People come to, I mean, even, I, mean, I get shot as I this here. I mean, people always ask, you know, uh, oh, vis-a-vis Goyim, vis-a-vis the government, can I do this, can I do that, can I do that, can I evade tax, do I have to do this? People come up with a million and one ways that they uh, try to uh, get around something. And they have heterim, it's either to the Goyim or to the government or to the Zionist state or uh, whatever, whatever, whatever the orientation they want to go with. 
And sometimes, you know, there may be technical heterim. There may be technical heterim. This is what Rav Yaakov said. Rav Yaakov said, morality is not really a divisible concept. Meaning, if you get into the habit of cheating, you get into the habit of denigrating, you get into the habit of being mavaza, but you say, oh, I'm only doing it to Goyim, I'm only doing it you know, to the Zionist state, I'm only doing it here. It's not, gonna ha it's not gonna happen. Even if you're right, maybe you're not right, but even if you're right that halachically you have certain heterim. But what's gonna happen? It's gonna spill over. You start cheating, you're gonna cheat Jews. You start cheating not religious Jews, you're gonna cheat religious Jews. <coughs> because it's not possible to say, you know, I'm a moral person vis-a-vis -vis this group and not vis-a-vis -vis that group. This is what Dr. Kamenetsky said. So he was not in favor of splitting hairs on midos. You know, I'm naïk in a certain way to this person and not to this person. Now, the emesis, this is a beferish in medrish in Tana de Veilio. He who kills the non-Jew will kill the Jew. He who cheats the non-Jew will cheat the Jew. You can't divide morality. I once read a certain Rosh Hashiva, okay, more on the modern side, but still it's, it's a good point, uh, was interviewing people uh, to be Magid Eishir in his yeshiva. So we asked him a whole question about, uh, let's assume that uh, you were entitled to a certain refund for something and you received in the mail 10 times more. Right? You, you were entitled to a $10 refund and instead you got uh, whatever it is, $100 or $1,000 back. What do you do with the money? So, now remember, this was an interview for a, uh, for a Gemara share, right? So they figured this is a halacha period. So they started being mafalpel, toisakum, and gezelakum, and all, all those different things, you know, uh, and pilpulim, and according to the ketzais, according to the nesivas, all the different opinions. So people were trying to impress them with their erudition. Uh, and then the last guy, or one of the guys, just said, I don't keep money that doesn't belong to me. I just don't do it. And who's the one? He, he's the one that got the job. <laughs> he's the one that got the job. Sometimes, you know, when we're learning, it's good to be mafalpo. In, indeed, it, you know, part of Lima Dataira is that we know the subtleties and we know the ins and outs. So, yeah, when it comes to learning and understanding, you try to be as subtle and as deep as you can be. When it comes to life, you sometimes have to be a little bit of a simpleton. Don't be so smart. You know, you know. What does a good moral person do? It's not always going to be so involved with draining a cup here and there. Um, but for those who are interested, there is actually a good book in this. Uh, Rabbi David Sears wrote a book in English called Compassion for Humanity in the Jewish Tradition. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. We have commercials for books. And uh, what he does is, this is an anthology of sources in which within, within the Jewish tradition, including Chazal, uh, Kabbalah, Chasidus, the notion of showing rachamim uh, for all people. He has another book about compassion for animals. So he actually does both animals and then humanity. And these are two books you could read together. Yeah. A group like uh, a terrorist cartel who seemingly supports terrorism, like terrorist states like Iran, and maybe even you could say we've got the Jews. Yeah. Um, can we just call them blatantly with shine and, and sing them a guy's chorus if you have to judge them favorably? Yeah, um, I tell you, I tell you, <laughs> that's a really, really hard question. I grapple with it. Let, let me just explain something. A Nuturi Karta has taken a turn uh, towards lunacy in, in recent uh, decades. Uh, Naturi Karta was a group of people who, were, who felt that we're not allowed to have a state of Israel until Mashiach comes. Uh, the Satmar Rebbe, of course, was their ideological leader. Uh, the founder was Rav Amram, not the founder, but the big leader for many, many years was Rav Amram Blau, who was a very, very righteous person. He was a big tzaddik and the like. And the fact that they were against the Medina, that, that was a position. It was a position that had support in Chazal. Again, I'm not saying it is the position, but it's, it had a support in Chazal. I, I, I would not look at them as 
crazy or whatever it was. This was a shita that Jews should not have a Medina until Mashiach comes. But at that point, they would never, ever, ever support a terrorist state. They would never, ever get into Holocaust denial, which many of them indeed suffered in the Holocaust. Uh, and they would never want to put Jews in danger. Rav Amram Blau was often arrested because he would stop a bus. You know, he would lie down in the middle of the street. He would do all sorts of things. And he would be beaten by police. But he never hit back. And he told his followers, never use violence against another Jew, no matter what they do to you. We don't hit back. That very much was his shita, that we're here to represent a sort of like, kind of like Gandhi, lahabdal, lahabdal, but this notion of peaceful resistance. And the Turi Karta was, that was the sherish of the Turi Karta. So a lot of people didn't like them, a lot of people thought they were crazy, a lot of people thought they were wrong, but this was a shita, and it was not a contradiction to caring about Jews, and it was not a contradiction to Avas Yisrael. Ram Ram Blau was indeed a person who loved Jews, including non-religious Jews. He just felt there ought not to be a, not to be a, a state, whatever. And, you know, other Gdolim thought that way as well. I mean, the Briskarov, the Chazanesh, I mean, they were not, you know, so in favor of a Medina to begin with. What's happened in recent years is Naturi Karta has become uh, more militant in some ways, in which they aggressively connect to uh, Palestinian terrorists and to Iraq and Iran and, and all, all those countries. There's even been on some lunatic fringe some Holocaust denial a little bit, which is totally incomprehensible. There's no possible way. So I, I don't want to use I don't want to use the word Russia. I, I don't want to call a Jew a Russia. Uh, I, I prefer to say that they're crazy. In other words, basically, they get carried away with an idea that on some level may have some legitimacy, but it then becomes so extreme that it gets distorted, and it gets messed up, and it gets perverted, and it gets corrupted. So I'm not going to you know, call somebody a Russia, but at this point, uh, it's, it's pushing in <coughs> insanity. Uh, there's no way. I think of Rav Ram Ramblau. I think of the Satmar Rebbe. I mean, there's no way they would sit down uh, with anybody from a terrorist, a terrorist state and kind of you know, go with them over their fellow Jews. Now, there is a story I'll tell you. Okay. Whenever I, I mention this story every once in a while, and I, I, I always get critical email. You see now, you see, see what censorship is? You know, you're afraid, to say, you're afraid to say things. So I'll tell you the story, but I'll tell you up front, I will tell you up front that many people deny the story. So I'm not telling you this story as absolute truth, but I hope it's true, and I wish that it's true, even though a lot of people say it's not true, that in 1968, when Hubert Humphrey was running against uh, Nixon for president. And Humphrey was an old liberal. He was supporting uh, Israel, Zionism, all the way back before 1948. He was a big, big, uh, he was a non-Jewish supporter of Zionism in Israel. So he was told there was a large group of Jews in Brooklyn that he can come to and get the vote. They were satmer. So he comes to Williamsburg. And he speaks, and he gives a whole speech about, I am a supporter of Israel, you know, back to 19, he's speaking to 10,000 Satmers in Williamsburg about his complete support for the Zionist state, and I will be a Zionist all of my life. And uh, he's a little concerned, like nobody's applauding, you know, whatever, whatever it is, like what's going on? Uh, so, so one of his Jewish advisors understands that something's wrong here. So the Jewish advisor goes to the, the story goes, goes to the, goes to Humphrey and says, I'm sorry, goes to the Rebbe and says, you know, Humphrey's a guy, he doesn't know, he, he doesn't really know, I mean, he didn't mean to offend, you know, please uh, forgive him, it was just, you know, he didn't realize uh, what the Rebbe's opinion was. So the Rebbe said, according to the story, no problem, he says, listen, I have a lot of disagreements with the state of Israel, but this is a family fight, this is a fight within the family. And I think my family is doing some very bad things, but I don't want my family to get hurt. So, uh, this was like after the Six-Day War. If my family needs weapons to be protected from Arabs and uh, Egypt, I want them to have the weapons. And afterwards, when they're B'Shalom, we'll talk about dismantling the state. But Chas V'Shalom, he says, I don't want a single Jew to ever get hurt. 
Again, I'll say it again in case whoever is going to write me that doesn't, didn't hear the first thing I said. Uh, I know, I know, I know that uh, many Satmers say this is not a true story, so I, I understand it. But uh, it, it, it is recorded as a story, and even if it's not a 100% true story, I think it reflects the attitude of a true Gadol in the sense that there are ideological disagreements. There are chiluke deus, and they could be very, very extreme. But a true Gadol still loves the Jewish people, no matter what, and doesn't want them to suffer. So where Neturi Karta, I think, kind of got off the, the railroad tracks is when they start siding with enemies who physically want to destroy other Jews. That already is, just cannot be justified under any circumstance. Yeah? Um, what was the reason why the, the Shvatim, when they took uh, Avina, when, when, when Shem took Avina, when the people of Shem, why did they attack it? Why did they have to destroy the whole city? What, 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 yeah. What, 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 what was the reason? Yeah, this is uh, an excellent uh, question that the Rambam deals with, right? The story of Shechem. So Shechem is both the city and the name of the guy. Shechem ben Hamor abducts Dina. Uh, he rapes Dina. And uh, Shimon and Levi come up with a plan. Oh, uh, we'll marry into you. Uh, just get everyone should get a bris. And on the third day when they're weak and they're sick, Shimon and Levi basically massacre the whole city of Shechem. Now, Yaakov was upset, but even Yaakov, right? Yaakov didn't say, you're murderers. Yaakov just said, you're making trouble for me in the land now. You know, it's hard for me. People will, uh, might attack me. So even Yaakov did not criticize the actual decision. So the question is, what halachic justification was there for this? So here's what the Rambam says, and this is a bit of a shtickel, shver Rambam. It's a big chiddush. We know that non-Jews are supposed to keep the seven Noahide laws, Sheva Mitzvah Sminei Noach. We know that if they transgress the Sheva Mitzvah Sminei Noach, they're Chayiv Misa, Chayiv Misa. So Shechem himself who took Dina is Chayiv Misa because Nichlal in the prohibition of Geneva is kidnapping. And Dina's abduction has the Lach of kidnapping. Okay, but that's only a Teretz, why they were justified in killing the man, Shechem ben Hamor. But what is the justification of eradicating the whole city? So says the Rambam, let's look at the seventh mitzvah ben Nayach. That's a mitzvah of dinim. And the Rambam says dinim is a mitzvah to establish a court system to punish wrongdoers. So, Shechem himself is guilty of Gezel. The city of Shechem is guilty because they did not create a court system to punish and adjudicate those offenses. Therefore, the whole city of Shechem was Chay of Misa. Now, this is the Rambam's thesis that essentially Shimon and Levi were executing the Chi of Misa under the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Nayach. Now, there, there are a number of questions on this. Question number one is, you're telling me the whole city of Shechem is Chayev because they didn't create a court system. Well, the whole city. I mean, they killed two-year-old kids. I, I mean, they killed everybody, everybody in Shechem. So who's Chayev? I mean, every... Every child is chayef to create a court system. So how do you understand that? So that actually is not so difficult because essentially the way we look at it is the chayef to make a court system is on the community. So the community is chayef misa. Okay, yeah, even, even those who are not involved in decision making. But the other nakuda that's interesting is the issue of vigilantism. I mean, let's assume that Shechem and the city of Shechem are guilty of violating the Noahide laws. Well, does that mean, uh, let's say today, uh, can I go out and kill a Ben Noach that I see, you know, a non-Jew, violating the Noahide laws, or do you need a basin or a court or some type of procedure, procedure? The Rambam is indicating that Shimon and Levi, you know, just on their own, have the right to enforce Noahide justice. Does that apply to me? You? You can get in trouble for this. A few years ago, there were some rabbanim that wrote, they claimed it was an academic book, 
But they talked about the idea that you're allowed to kill, private, a private citizen is allowed to kill a guy that is transgressing the seven commandments of God. Now keep in mind, that would include theft. The, the guy is stealing an apple from a fruit stand. <laughs> Gezo, you know. Um, now they say they were writing it academically, just in Lumbus, but uh, I know the police started investigating. I think they were going to be, for a while, these rabbanim were going to be arrested for incitement. So maybe I'd be careful, uh, you know, not to, don't quote me on this. Uh, but this is the, uh, uh, but I'm saying this is what the Rambam is. The Rambam basically says the chi of Misa was that they were over on the commandment to establish a court system to punish uh, wrongdoing. Uh, yeah. Well, I, 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 there, there is indeed a machlokas, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's dependent. I think the Rambam works either way because even if they are Jews who are not governed by the Noachide laws, but the halacha is that Jews can punish B'nai Noach for being over on the Sheva Mitzvah. So whatever their status was, they would still have the same uh, legitimation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Sefer Hayashar. Uh, Sefer Hayashar is a uh, is a title that is actually used for a few svarim. I, I know I know which one you're referring to. Uh, we have besides Rabbeinu Tam, who's quoted a lot in Tosos. Rabbeinu Tam actually wrote a Sefer of Chidushim, which happens to also be called Sefer Hayashar. It's not uh, looked at very much, but it's from Rabbeinu Tam. But you are correct. There is a much earlier uh, book, Sefer Hayashar which essentially is very similar to a medrash filled with stories about uh, augmenting the Chumash, stories of the Avo, stories about Moshe Rabbeinu, stories about miracles in the desert. And there are many, many miraculous events that are described in the Sefer Hayashor that do not appear in the Chumash and may not even appear in other midrashim. Now, the Taira itself refers to a book called Sefer Hayashor by saying, uh, when it describes a certain miracle, it says, oh, the details of this are written in the Sefer Hayashar. But, 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 the book that we have called Sefer Hayashar used that title precisely because they wanted to link it to that, but that's not, that's not the Sefer Hayashar of the Torah. The Sefer Hayashar of the Torah is lost. That much, I think, everybody admits. So the question becomes, uh, is the Sefer Hayashar a medrash of Chazal, which would give it a, an authority, or is it a later composition? Um, I believe it does not have the full status of a medrash, meaning the word medrash is a bit of a confusing term. You know, the authoritative midrashim are from the Tanoim and the Amoraim. But there's a lot of midrashim that are actually later. They're from the Gaonim or the early Rishinim, even though the name medrash was attached to them. Uh, and they have, you know, different stories and the like. Some of those stories may be part of a Messiah, some of them may not be. So, for example, Hanukkah has a number of Midrashim of Hanukkah, which are Lav Davka uh, from, from Chazal. So I think Sefer Ayasha would fall under more of the questionable uh, Midrash. Yeah? Mortal has to listen to Jewish music in the bathroom. Yeah, so, so it, can you listen to Jewish music in the bathroom? So, so, it, so, so it depends. Uh, if you're listening to, to uh, uh, just a, a, a nigun, a tune, uh, for sure you could. Uh, if you're listening to words, so it depends what the words are. If the words are pesukim, you know, even without the name of Hashem, you're not allowed to listen to them because you would then be thinking about pesukim or mamare chazal uh, in the bathroom. And even uh, thinking about it uh, would, not be, would not be proper. So it kind of depends. Meaning where it gets a little difficult is uh, sometimes you have, let's say, an English song that talks about how wonderful it is to come back to you, Shalayim, you know, whatever, a, a, a song like that. Uh, that's a little bit, that's a very close call. Perhaps you might be allowed to listen to something like that. But any Pasuk that uh, has Mamare Chazal or Psukim, whether it's in Hebrew or in English, uh, you're not allowed to listen to in the bathroom or the shower, whatever, yeah. So in the context of that, uh, does the Mr. of speaking in the bathroom when you go to use the bathroom, is that correct? It's a, it's a proper behavior, yeah. Uh, the reason why I'm not saying it's usher is the following, that uh, it's true 
that the Gemara says it's usher to speak uh, in a Beis HaKisei. But some say that only applied to the old outhouses because the outhouses, the excrement was accumulating and as a result, Shadim would go there and various evil spirits and speaking could cause you to be injured by the Shadim. Some say in the modern uh, bathroom, it's not that way, it gets, things get flushed away. You don't have Shadim, you don't have uh, all of the negative impacts. So some say that issue may not apply today, but it's still better to minimize. And yeah. so then, what if uh, I'm just going to the shower, I'm not going to use the bathroom, can I, can I say, can I speak, can I... Uh, also like a door yeah, yeah. Well, well, number one, if if you're if you are in an enclosed shower, for sure you could, because it's not usher to talk when you're naked, as long as you're not speaking divrei divrei Torah. So you are correct. In an enclosed shower, for sure you could. Uh, the question is, if it's an open shower with a toilet, uh, that may be more of a more of a question. Is enclosed completely closed? No, if, if, if the mechitza is ten tfachim high, even if it's open on top, that's a mechitza that makes it a separate, a separate rishus, so that would be okay. Uh, yeah? What about talking in the mikvah that Rabbi Zohar says that someone has a right to do it, and it's general etiquette in mikvah in general? So, yeah, there is a Zohar that says that. It, you know, again, I, it, it's uh, obviously, if the Zohar says something, one should pay attention to it, but... Uh, the minog seems to be to me mekel on it. Uh, mo most people are not particularly machmer on, on that Indian. I, I don't know why, uh, here, but, but, but it seems that we, we are mekel. Uh, yeah? I have a question about higher advice. If a train is full day, full way to never come in, will be a problem for Jew? Yeah, so the problem is this. The problem is, the laws of Tumas Mesa are very complicated, meaning like this. A Kohen is usher to be in direct contact with a mace, right? And if the Kohen kept the halachas, he was never in direct contact with a mace. However, even if a Kohen is not in direct contact with a mace, he may still have the status of a Tame mace. So for example, if I went to a funeral, right? So I'm now, uh, right? The mace is called Avi Avosatuma. So I'm an Afatuma. If I shake hands with the Kohen, He's tummy, he becomes a Rishon Latuma, you see? So the problem is, you could be a person who is not allowed to enter the, the Azara of the Mikdash, even though Lamaisa, you were not over on the laws of Kahuna. Although, as I'm thinking, I, that actually what I said is not a good answer, because the MS is, uh, if the only problem of the Kohen is being a Rishon Latuma, he can go to a Mikvah. I mean, you, you only need Para Duma. Right, if you're in direct contact with the mace. The secondary forms of tuma, uh, which a Kohen might incur, but they could be masulak by mikveh. So you have a good, so I'm saying you have a good kasha, actually. Meaning it might be gemult for a person to be able to. Uh, but let me point out another thing. And that is, chazal uh, were geyser a tuma of Eretz Ha'amim, meaning any Kohen who was ever in Chutz Laaretz as Midrabanan, the halacha of Atame Meis Mamish. So if the Kohen ever traveled <laughs> outside of Eretz Yisrael, he would already be usher to go to the Harabais. But, so, so, but still, your question still remains. He lived in Eretz Yisrael, he never left Eretz Yisrael, he was never Matame Lames. What's going to be the problem? I don't know if there is a problem. It may very well be that it would be mutter for him. Yeah. Yeah. What American Yeah, so, so the problem is, uh, in every loan, you must define with specificity what the medium is. Meaning, if I lend you a shekel loan, then you can certainly pay me back in shekels, the same amount of shekels, no matter what the exchange rate uh, is. Uh, and you can also pay me in dollars but the dollars have to be equal to the shekel rate at the time of payment. Me meaning like this, if I give you 10 shekel, you have to pay me 10 shekel. You can pay me 10 shekel in shekels, or you can pay me an amount of dollars that I could get 10 shekels for at the time you pay me. That's the thing. But this is very important, because you could define the loan as a shekel loan, 
or you could define the loan as a dollar loan. That's up to the lender and the borrower to be kaveya. But whatever the medium of kavios, once you have that kavios, the change in the exchange rates are not going to affect uh, the payment there. Okay, so you have to be very careful about that. Yeah. What's the importance of being, I heard this from many rabbis, um, normal and it means and normal. <laughs> Why is it good to be normal? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, well, I mean, part of why it's good to be normal is that, uh, well, it depends. I mean, normal is, is actually a vague term a little bit. But being normal is that people look at you and they see a person of balance, meaning to say if a person is extreme in one direction, then people look at them and they say, uh, you know, if they think you're crazy, they, it's a chilul Hashem. They don't want to imitate you. They don't want to learn from you. They uh, don't think you're a good influence on them or their children. So a person has to know that we have an achrayas to try to influence people, to try to be a good influence, to try to be someone that people look up to and they want to, they want to emulate. So number one, if you want to have influence on others, you need to be uh, in a state of balance. But number two, it's also part of your own spiritual development. You know, imagine a person who was, uh, did exercise to build up himself, but the only thing he worked on was his left uh, index finger. So he has this real powerful index finger that can move a whole table with his finger, but the rest of his body has fallen apart. There's something wrong with the picture in which we have to develop every aspect of ourselves. And if we only work on one particular aspect, you know, that's, what, that's what it means not to be normal, meaning you're extreme in one mahalach and not in the other mahalach. So there's something pogum, there's something defective about that person. A person who is so meticulous in bein adam lamakam and not bein adam l'chaveirei, or the other way, uh, that's not a shlemus. Shlemus means everything is working together. Now being normal doesn't, just, doesn't mean, you, you know, you do what normal people do necessarily. I mean, normal people in the world <laughs> do all sorts of things that we might call a chiyif kores, you know, uh, and, and the like. So uh, normal doesn't mean that, doesn't mean do averus, but it means you're a person in which everything is balanced. All parts of you are working together. You don't have one aspect of you that is like in this direction and everything else is very low, but you try to work on all parts of yourself in a good way. And once again, I, I, it's actually very uh, clear that gedolim are b'derech klal very normal <laughs> in that way. And maybe you'll get a definition if you look at how gedolim behave. Maybe you'll understand what the idea of normal means in that context. Um, okay, uh, maybe we'll stop here. Anyway, thank you and uh, have a good uh, good chaps. <laughs>